All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. In this episode, I'm joined by Chris Berger. He has a PhD in computer science and is an experienced CTO, currently building a quant trading company in stealth mode called Quantodian. He discovered Bitcoin when it hit $1, but only got in when it was $11. Very late, Chris. He was initially skeptical, but kept studying the technical aspects of Bitcoin over the years and became a committed Bitcoin maximalist and proponent of the Austrian School of Economics. Since 2019, he's been writing extensively about Bitcoin, advocating for its potential to become the dominant unit of account. In Bitcoin, you always find new people to learn from, and Chris is someone with a depth of knowledge that I hope to dive into today. So uh, welcome, Chris. Thank you very much for the introduction. Great. Nice to meet you, Bram. Yeah, nice to meet you, man. Well, I, I love to meet people that, you know, were so early and, you know, are also still here. I know you were a bit more early than me. I, I started in 2013, um, but it's uh, it, it's hard, you know, but I think we'll get to that in this conversation. Um, you know, people who've been into Bitcoin for a long time, I think, have a interesting journey. So I'd love to, to chat about that. Um, well... So you discovered it at $1, but you were not too interested because digital currencies were nothing new, like the Linden dollar existed. Can you, can you tell me about your journey and also about the Linden dollar? Yeah, so when you said I discovered Bitcoin at $1, that is maybe not quite accurate. But indeed, I, I stumbled on this very short slash dot article, which was published in 2011, right when Bitcoin hit $1. And that's the first time I heard about it. So the name registered in my brain i remember bitcoin from then on um but yeah it, it just didn't really stick because I, I i remember seeing digital currency and around that time people were talking about digital currencies but game currencies something like the linden dollar and i forget what else was around at the time but there were i think there were a couple of others and so it 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 was sort of conflated in my mind. It, so Bitcoin and Linden dollar were sort of the same thing at that point. And it's only a little bit later when I read up about Bitcoin that I understood that it was fundamentally different. And that's when I had this aha moment and it, it, that indeed it, it's, it is something that is likely very interesting. Uh, but I had this aha moment only after this. Well, it wasn't the first bubble, but the bubble that made Bitcoin go to $30 and then and then down. So I bought in just a little bit right after that first bubble. That was my first exposure to Bitcoin. It wasn't very much, unfortunately. <laughs> we all do mistakes. And uh, well, you've been in Bitcoin since 2013. I'm sure you could kill yourself for not buying more when you when yes. you first bought in. But yeah, that's that's just the way it is. Yeah. I definitely have less than before. <laughs> but uh yeah, I I, th I think everyone has that, right? But when you talk about the aha moment, did that come from this price movement or also no. did you already like uh, read up on it? Yeah, so it was actually it was more than that. So, of course, Bitcoin in itself was interesting, but I, I think I was really primed to, to like Bitcoin because for some time I had been thinking about the fiat money system and how, how much it sucks. You know where inflation comes from. I all, had all these questions well before 2011. So I read a little bit about economics. I read Milton Friedman. I read pieces by Mises. Um, I regularly read articles on Mises.org. And all of that was, when was that? Maybe 2008 or something like that. So it was well before I discovered Bitcoin. Now I had actually been scratching my head of, you know, is it possible to create uh, something like digital gold. Um, mm -hmm. I think many of us libertarians have thought about this, but I, I didn't come up with a solution far from it. I had no idea of how something like that might be possible. I had read uh, Cryptonomicon. Uh, it's a novel by Neil Stevenson. I don't know if you would call that science fiction or not, but it's a, sort of an alternative history novel where you have one part of the story taking place during the Second World War and the other in the late 90s in the Silicon Valley. And so there are a bunch of people who basically discover Nazi gold and they, they wonder what to do about it. And what they do is that they create a bank which issues tokens or pieces of paper which are redeemable for gold. Mm. And I thought that was a pretty neat idea. 
But of course, it's uh, legally very complicated because you can get the gold confiscated or someone can come in and just, you know, hold, hold a gun to your head. Um, yeah. So, um, but all these ideas have been in my mind since uh, before Bitcoin. And so when Bitcoin showed up and when I read about it, I, I understood it was something really big, a big, very big idea. Yeah. And did you come across any of the of the papers uh, that were there before Bitcoin? Um, no. Like Nick Szabo or Wei Dai or an, anyone? No, I did not. No. Oh, I had no idea those existed. I, I probably didn't, didn't even know what to, to look for. So no, yeah. I, I, I didn't know. Yeah. Interesting. And, and now that you, uh, you, you probably know this graph, right, where you see like all the publications around cryptography or eCash and stuff like that. Have you read them now also or...? No, I not no no I haven't no. Uh, yeah. I think let me see. Did I Adam Back's uh, hash cash? Yeah, yeah, that's one too. That. Yeah, but no, the others way die and um, and Chomian signatures and uh, what else? No, I didn't read the papers. I have to admit, no. Mm. Yeah. Um, I I was thinking when when I when you sent me uh, you know the Linden dollar already existed. I thought of. How I actually, uh, because I knew the linen dollar, it, it, it was the currency in Second Life, right? And this is actually how, um, in, in my country, I couldn't use my debit card to, to buy Bitcoin, and I wanted to buy buy Bitcoin. So um, I uh, I figured out that uh, the linen dollar was uh, traded on, I don't know, some obscure exchange somewhere for a certain token, uh, and that token was traded on uh, BTCE. I don't know if you remember that website. Yeah. Um, uh, which traded for Bitcoin. So uh, I started uh, a Second Life account. I went into Second Life. I walked to an ATM. <laughs> I used my credit card to, I don't know how much I bought, but I think, you know, if I bought for like $100 and, you know, I, I traded for the other token and the other token for Bitcoin, I think I ended up with like $60 in Bitcoin <laughs> or something at that moment. Oh. Um, but actually, when I researched that or, or figured that out, I was also pretty surprised that there were so many tokens already like at that point i, I don't think a lot of people realized like uh, Do dogecoin uh, is from that era also right 2013 2014ish but there was a lot of other stuff already yeah. and people were trading it also there was namecoin there was litecoin yeah. those were early I yeah. remember there was one thing which was basically a copy of Bitcoin, but with a much faster emission schedule called Tenebrix. Hmm. Uh, yeah, there was there were, there was a bunch of stuff, but the dominance yeah. was much lower compared to Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, true. But I I do remember thinking, am I late? What is going on? <laughs> like it it felt like I discovered something, and then like there was already this kind of like world in a sense of all these all these tokens. And I, yeah, I remember thinking that like, am I am I too late? Already, you know, like what? Well, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. How and not does that only work? were there the, these um, alternative coins, altcoins, um, there were also shares of companies you could buy. So you could buy shares of ASIC miner. You could buy shares of Satoshi dice. Um, yeah, yeah. There yeah. was this exchange by uh, the Romanian. Um, it'll come back to me. Uh, Mircea Pupescu. Um, mm -hmm. Ceausescu. Okay. Uh, the trilemma.com guy Mir mm. what was what was the name of his exchange he had this exchange where you had to first pay 50 or so bitcoin just to be allowed to trade on it oh yeah i remember that yeah. yes yeah yeah crazy so all that activity was already there right yeah f very very interesting um I, I i think we'll get to that but i want to ask you when you say like you know you are predestined you were predestined to like bitcoin you were already like um you know, researching fiat money, um, and 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 reading like Mises and stuff. What what are like the main points of of Austrian economics? You know, uh, for example, made by by Rothbard or Mises that stood out to you. But also, like, uh, how how do they go against the current money system? And I'm always very surprised. Like, this is not my background, but when I read this. I'm like this makes so much more sense than than where we are now, and and I just wonder why is it not adopted? Yeah, uh, it's hard to give a short summary about this, but I mean the whole current system is Keynesian, basically. 
Um, there are several ideas associated to Keynesianism. One is that a little bit of inflation is good. And so that already doesn't give you hard money. Because if you have hard money, something like Bitcoin, then you don't have a little bit of inflation. You have a fixed money supply and that's it. And then the prices can either go up or down depending on, uh, you know, uh, d demand and productivity. But it, it's it's not dictated by the, mon by the monetary policy. There is no monetary, monetary policy. Yes. <laughs> there were a couple of things, yeah, that have always annoyed me with this. I mean, why, why, why is there a monetary policy to begin with? How how can money just be created out of thin air? Mm. Um, those are all very naive questions, but those are questions you have to ask when you you don't know anything uh, about the monetary system. So I think what really bothered me most with the fiat system is that. What you automatically get is is a system where the money supply increases almost every year. It, it can happen that the monetary supply shrinks, but it's it's rather a rare event. Most of the time, uh, any measure of monetary supply will increase by something like seven percent a year. And so that yeah. means that if you don't have seven percent more money every year, you're losing out someone else is getting that money and you're yeah you're getting relatively poor um and i think that's yeah it's it's a huge part of the problems we currently have in in the western world and probably not only in the western world in many parts of the world yeah uh, that we we have a big gap between rich and poor which i'm not you know fundamentally opposed as on on principle but it's it's the fact that the the monetary system is is completely messed up, which which causes this. Yeah, it's not necessary to have this. Hey there, I want to ask you for a quick favor. I noticed something interesting. Seventy five percent of my viewers aren't subscribed yet. Subscribing helps me grow this channel, ensuring more great content each week. So if you're enjoying our conversations on Bitcoin for Millennials, please consider hitting the subscribe button on YouTube or the follow button on your favorite podcasting app. I'm super grateful for everyone who already joined and shared their thoughts. Your feedback really keeps me going. And I want to ask you to continue doing that. I try to respond to all the comments and also the emails that I get uh, and DMs on Twitter, etc. So don't stop doing that. I'll keep going. Now let's get back to the conversation. Well, you said a quick summary is difficult, but I, I do think that this is like the, the real point. You know, if, if you just make, if you make more units of the money, then all the existing units of the money will be worth less every year, right? And and the fact that people don't see that, for me, is kind of like, it, it shows how big the gaslighting actually is, right? Because we never question it. When other people question it, you know, you're like, oh, yeah, what are you talking about? Or this and that, right? Like, it's not, it's, it's not questioned um, at all. I had uh, uh, Leon Wankum uh, on the podcast. He's a... Uh, I have to say it correctly, I think Master uh, of Economics. And he said, I never learned about what money is. <laughs> you know, so so how, how would regular citizens understand what money is, let alone the fact that, you know, the value goes down every year by such a big percentage that you have to mitigate next to, you know, whatever you're already spending your time on. You know, that's, uh, I, I think that's kind of how I got into more of these Austrian way, uh, Austrian way of thinking, but not really by reading a lot about it, but just more, it was just a thinking true, like, huh, you have like this system, these ideas, and you have these other ideas, and just like, I think the Austrian ideas just make a lot more rational sense. It shows that equal playing field, I think, that you refer to when you talk about, you know, there's always people that are richer than, than other people, you know, because people have different output in productivity so some people are more rewarded than other people which you know is fair but it, if around that there there's a third party that influences what that output is worth you know that that should not be the case then it's not a level uh, level playing field yeah i think it it goes really far so it's it's uh you can say okay there's a bigger gap between rich and poor no big deal, but in fact, you can see that there are a lot of protests currently in Europe, which are specifically due to to this divide, where people don't understand why they just can't get ahead in life, 
Um, I'm convinced also that people are having fewer kids because of that, just because it's more and more difficult to have three kids. Uh, yeah. Financially, it's a, it's a huge problem for, for most people. Yeah. So it has very far-reaching consequences. Um, yeah, also, not only that, but it not only the, the divide between rich and poor, but also when you think about what you need to do to get ahead, so to, to get more 7% or more return on your money, means that you need to take a lot of risk. Um, so you need to, to invest your money and you need to be very smart about it because even if you invest your money in the S&P 500, and don't panic when there's a crash, et cetera, that will also net you something like 7% a year. So not not that great. You're also not getting ahead. So if you really want to get ahead, then you need to use leverage or debt. Yeah. Um, and that's that's a dangerous thing. So you're playing with fire. Yeah. Whereas originally how things used to be um, before, during the Bretton Woods agreement and be, before that is that you just had to save money. Exactly. Yeah. People are pushed from saving to investing to, well, gambling in some sense, right? And I yeah. I think uh, what you say about risk is, is also how I think about it, right? Because in general, you already take risk with your education and your job or your venture. You know, you're starting a new company that's risk taking, right? Because you you use money to buy time to figure out, is this a good idea and, and, sh and should I pursue it, right? So you're taking that risk. Um, but then when you get home, you have to take more risk. You yeah. know, and, 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 and most people don't even know that they have to do that. You know, they, they follow a certain narrative, of course, like I'm going to invest or buy a house or whatever. Um, I talked to Peter Dunworth, who's like a, um, uh, a financial advisor for like high net worth individuals. And he says, this is my job. Like my only job is to figure out how to mitigate the risk. But it's my actual job. But there's lots of people that don't even know that they have this job as well right and i think right. that's a good illustration of how uninformed we are and and that we don't understand that yeah you know, we are subject of a game that we don't even know we're playing you know like it's kind of right, like that yeah. and yeah. uh yeah so i agree it, it 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 reaches way way further than that um i wanted to ask you about you know you you found bitcoin early you bought it at 11 then it went to two you know so that wasn't really a nice first uh, first experience right but <laughs> after wasn't that a lot of money though i have to admit it wasn't much but yeah so well still you know yeah. you, you you think a positive uh, so, uh, you know you, you felt positive of it and, and then it went down but uh, after that of course it went it went up again can you kind of elaborate as to how how you developed your resilience over the years like if you've been here from 2011 you've had uh, four halvings, yeah, all, all of them basically. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, how how did you develop that resilience? But also, what do you think actually builds conviction? Hmm. That's a good question because I I think I was lucky in a sense that I went through this first drawdown because I lived through it. So I first thing is that I knew that it's normal for Bitcoin to have huge drawdowns. Um, and the other thing is that I knew what it felt like. So um, I, I learned this with something that, you know, was not something that would have completely changed my life. So it was a good, good learning experience. It's something that might have pinched a little bit or barely, but it, it wouldn't have completely changed my life had it gone to zero. Not at all. Far from that. So I it was, yeah, I was very fortunate in that sense. Mm. Um, yeah, and then I guess how you you build conviction. It's probably it's a different path for for everyone, but for for me the conviction was there quite early. So when I understood the principle, then the convic conviction was there. Uh, it got strengthened when I really understand stood every every piece of Bitcoin. Then of course it 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 was even stronger. Um, but yeah, it, as soon as I understood the principle, it was there. It was clear to me that the world needs something almost exactly like this so and how so. how would you describe that principle yeah so the world needs uh something with money like properties but with a finite supply that's basically it um and that's transmittable over the internet unlike gold yeah 
it's so gold funny, is funny good how basic it is actually <laughs> yeah yeah that's it yeah it's 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 great it's very simple um yeah that's it for me yeah and so how do you feel now when you when you have these drawdowns obviously the the number is a bit different but do you still feel it i mean i still feel it i know I, yeah i know nothing changed but i still feel it yeah i i, I used to pride myself that these drawdowns do nothing to me that they're normal but it's it's not true of course the drawdowns suck and you you prefer it when the number goes up and it's much more much more pleasant yeah um, I, just because you feel vindicated you know you know i uh i knew it was going to go up it's a very I'm nice right <laughs> yeah. yeah i'm right <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. um I talked about this with um with Thomas Strolight. Uh I, I think the resilience also or what is also part of the resilience is you know the, the comments from other people or you know if you advocate for Bitcoin you have to be a bit of bit courageous because a lot of people don't understand it yet or don't see it yet. Like how how have you experienced that like in, in your real life circle for example no one gets it <laughs> not really i bet even the people who buy in right now they don't really get it mm. uh, i bet a lot of people buy in because they think they should and that there is something that they didn't quite understand yeah but i think very few people really get it yeah but it, probably that's normal we can't expect everyone to fully get it i think uh i i doubt a lot of people fully understand many other things. If we talk about, I don't know, our monetary system, our democracy, uh, so-called democracy or whatever, um, few people really think everything through. Um, most people think about it a bit, but not, but not 100%. Yeah. So my experience has been like this, that, yeah, I've, it was even different early on because it was such a bitcoin was such a small thing that it was even more difficult to convince people i tried to convince a few friends but almost all of them reacted well i would say negatively or just ignored my advice completely and said yeah what 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 is this thing it doesn't make sense what you're talking about why are you so convinced and yeah i did manage to convince a few people but but not many mm. I think that's so interesting, right? Because you are obviously an intelligent person, you know, with with a certain background, right? Uh, and and still, there there are people that don't take you serious. You know, I I think this is fascinating in general. When um, you that know, was you talk, at the time, but you know. now I think there might be the opposite problem, and and that if I tell people <laughs> to do it, they might think, okay, this guy has done well, so so I should do the same thing as him just because he's done well and not because they thought things through. I yeah, I don't think people think that okay this also, this fair guy point. Looks... Yeah. Pardon me? Now fair point. Yeah. 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 And so so how... it's only now that they would say oh you're smart back in those days they would have said you're yeah. dumb as rock. What what is <laughs> <Yeah. that thing? laughs> Bitcoin stupid. Yeah. But I mean this is also the this this bigger thing in in adopting Bitcoin is that kind of like personal challenge that everyone goes through right or, or or journey that you have to be open enough to first i'd say like just listen to other people you don't have to you know i uh, i think you would agree but i think in general i just say you have to study bitcoin yeah you don't have to believe me you don't have to buy it like we're not advocating for people to buy it it's more like you know i found this lead or thread somewhere and it led me to something that really improved my life and my outlook on the future um and something i think about every day basically yeah i think you should do that too you know or it could help it could help you and i'm sharing that because i like you or i love you and that's basically just it right but uh i i, I think the apprehension of lots of people um just only from that little message already uh, shows you how how far we have to go. I think still, like how 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 people are still entrenched in just fiat thinking and an entire system. But yeah, I mean, just as like we said at the beginning, that we can't really expect most people to be risk managers and think very thoroughly about how to invest their money so that they get a, a, a good return in the very long term. 
uh, not care about drawdowns, etc. Maybe it's also too much to ask that everyone do their own research regarding Bitcoin. Yeah. Of course, in an ideal world, yes. Um, but if if we are being realistic, I'm not too surprised that most people will never do this research. Um, yeah. But yeah, if 10% do, that that would be great. So how many people in the world do you think actually understand what this is? Like a number. Oh boy, how how to even estimate this? Uh, really understand? I don't know. Tops a million? Yeah. I'm 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 lower, I think. Yeah. But it's hard, right? Like to figure out like where are we? Or to really think like how uh, I agree with you, like we cannot expect that everyone understands what this is, but well, maybe, well, not everyone, but maybe the majority, right? Like, I mean, money is really the basis of how we exchange value and interact with each other, right? Like it, it's the basis Definitely. of everything that is produced from, from those personal agreements that, that we make with each other, right? So it is actually. The, one of the most important things in the world if not the most important thing yeah of course don't mean to say that people shouldn't do their own research they definitely should and the more the better but yeah yeah but, no, but... no no i i agree i mean more like we yeah we cannot expect it but i think like how early we are i also i think tops definitely a million not uh not, not more yeah. than that which is yeah. wild i'd yes. say it's yeah. very tiny very 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 tiny but uh, what I find, do find interesting is, for example, this, we don't necessarily have to talk about this, but just the ETF adoption, right? Like, uh, I think I said uh, on another recording, like, I just find it very interesting that people that should know about this, finance, economics, money, that they are adopting this internet idea that's only 15 years old, right? Randomly released on an obscure forum. And the fact that they adopt it, I don't like it. That they figured it out, but I think they figured it out, right? They, they definitely understand. Yeah, quite possible indeed. Yeah. Do well, I... there's so many ideas on the internet. Like, why this one? Well, there are money people, and money can attract smart people. So, yeah, when money is involved, it's more interesting. Yeah. Yeah. True. Well, yeah, we're going to see. But I think it's fun. It's a fun thought exercise to think about, like, how many people do actually understand this. Like, yeah, it's just it's just not a lot. But maybe it's also the wrong way to think about it. Like, it, it, it is thinking about it like an adoption curve where there's we start at zero and we end up at 100%. Uh, but if you, you think of it as a, as a journey in terms of price, where the price is going, the journey will never be over. It will never... It will never reach a price, a terminal it stops. price. Yeah. So it will be just like the stock market or anything else. I mean, it will just continue to gain in value forever, at least as long as human productivity goes up in time. The value mm -hmm. of Bitcoin will also go up in time. It will yeah. take something really strange for Bitcoin to not continue to, to grow in value in the long term. I don't know what's going to happen in a million years, of course, but for the yeah. next decades or so, for sure, it will. And why do you keep... mention uh, human productivity? I am actually, uh, I'm actually writing an article uh, that I'm going to name like Bitcoin is the is a standard measurement for human productivity. Right. But why do yeah. you think about human productivity? Yeah. So I mean, uh, right now we look at the price of Bitcoin in terms of dollars, but ultimately that's the wrong way to look at it. You should look at it in terms of how much you can you can buy with it, and so. How much you can buy depends on the amount of human productivity. If human productivity goes down, say, because there's nuclear war and uh, nothing can be produced anymore, then, of course, one Bitcoin buys you less stuff than nowadays. Uh, but in a, in a normal world where um, things continue more or less as normal in terms of, you know, technological progress, etc., productivity goes up and Bitcoin should go up in value. Yeah. Not only that, in addition, I mean, every year there's a certain number of Bitcoins which are lost. Uh, I cannot really estimate how much that is, but it's it's not zero. I mean, it's some, some number above that. So just because of that, those that are left over should already gain um, in value. 
it's like refer yeah it's like deflation i want to say reverse inflation but like, yeah it's and it's funny because it's so 180 uh uh opposed to to the fiat system right like the, the fact that the the ones that are left actually gain in value instead of the other way around so um you're obviously very technically uh, technical and you and you dove into bitcoin in that way what is technically the beauty of bitcoin i don't think that there's one piece that is a technological marvel i think it's just how everything fits together um i think satoshi really kept it as simple as possible hmm. There was, okay, the hash function, of course, but this is something, you know, that's not something that he invented by far. It's, it's old. It's very, okay, for computer scientists, it's, very, uh, it's a very simple concept. It's a one-way function. That's very easy. Uh, Merkle tree is also quite easy to understand if, if you know computer stuff. Um, yeah, and then maybe the proof of work is the thing which I hadn't thought of at all prior to Bitcoin, but which is fairly easy to understand as well. And then basically he made these three pieces work together, um, together with the monetary policy. Yeah. The monetary policy in itself doesn't matter that much as long as it's um, a monetary policy with a, with a, an ultimately fixed supply, which is important. Yeah. Um, because otherwise, if it were not, then there would be too big a temptation to fork off and create a fork with a lower supply. Um, so that thing would then beat the version of the original version of Bitcoin had Bitcoin not had a fixed supply at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, more about the enforcement of the, of the monetary protocol than, than the actual amount. Right. I think, uh, there was also people that found, uh, uh, old forum post by Satoshi that said like the 21 million was random. Other people say it does have a special, um, like meaning or you know there's something mathematical behind it but if i remember correctly he said like it was random but it doesn't really matter if it's 18 21 or 30 32 it's more the, the point is more that that what is promised as the rule of this system is actually enforced every 10 minutes or well con you know checked every 10 minutes and then enforced every four years right i think that's more the the the, the point that it's making yeah. the, the fact exactly that, that it just keeps cheese. going Yes. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Indeed. Yeah. All right. I don't know um, how close Nick Sable actually got to developing the same thing when he developed. Uh, was it Bitgold, the name of it? But I think Bitgold, it was actually yeah. pretty close. I think I, it was pretty close. I, I I don't think he had the proof of work part. Ah, okay. Correct. So the, okay, I, I, I think I think there's one element missing. But okay, yeah. Yeah, I I, I think like the beauty is in this combination that. Of very technical stuff, but eventually, I think also how you just explained it, like it is very pure and simple and straightforward. There's not really like ifs and buts. Like there's not a lot. Maybe the difficulty adjustment, which is something that Satoshi did add. Um, that's maybe an if or but. But but for the rest, yeah, it is just uh, what it is, right? Yeah. Um, well, you also see that in just the nine pages of the of the white paper, of course. Um, when when you started researching more about like price evolution, um, you found um, the previous guest on uh, on this podcast, Giovanni Santostasi, and his posts about uh, the Bitcoin power law. Um, yeah, I just shared with you off mic. Like I I also found him on Reddit, but not the original post. So you found the original one, the after five years one. Or not like that. I found that's... the one he wrote in 2018. So I'm I, I he wrote some which were earlier, but I don't know if he published them on Reddit or Facebook. Mm, but he yeah. he wrote stuff earlier than that. Yeah. yeah. So what is uh can you, can you give like a summary of your view on the Bitcoin power law and and the implications of it? Yeah, maybe uh, before even talking about that is that. Before I landed on Giovanni's post, um, the price of Bitcoin was something completely mysterious to me. So uh, I guess like a lot of people, I was looking at the price of Bitcoin on um, on a linear scale, linear, linear time and linear price. Um, and I was convinced that the price was going to go up long term. 
but there was nothing more I could say about it at all. Um, hmm. Probably I had a gut feeling that the price increases should be roughly exponential in time, but I, I, I couldn't really see the exponential pattern. So it was something that was really mysterious to me. I had no way of knowing, you know, what rational expectations I should have. It's not like when you invest in the, in an index fund, like say the S and P 500, and you can say, okay, now I'm expecting roughly 7% growth per year. Um, it will not be the same every year, but over a 30 year period, that's roughly what I, what I expect for Bitcoin. I had absolutely no clue. Mm. And it was only after seeing Giovanni's log log plot that it immediately became clear. So I, I can't even remember how I landed on his post, I guess just by browsing Reddit. And I I saw this graph and it said Bitcoin and I looked at it and it was like, what? That doesn't look like the price of Bitcoin the way I'm I'm used to seeing it. What what's going on here? And so I looked at it a few seconds longer. And then I was like, oh, he scaled the x-axis logarithmically as well. Oh, okay. And then, then things made sense. And you can see this straight line. And it, was, it looks like a very straight line. Yeah. And that, that's a great sign. Hmm. Because then it means that you, you see a relationship between two things happening. And it's a very simple relationship. It's between time and price. And that's yeah. great. It means that you can forecast what's going to happen. It's the best thing imaginable in terms of forecasting ability. And so that gave me uh, some some really good indication of where I expect the price to be in the future. It was a huge relief or a big aha moment again. Um, yeah. Maybe not like discovering Bitcoin itself, but it was yeah, it was it was quite fundamental. Where my mind kind of gets stuck is it immediately goes to the why kind of like why is this happening like how can this happen because there's so many elements involved with bitcoin right yeah. like okay energy consumed by the miners a number of wallets uh general adoption the price the time like all these things and and so for example one thing that i find hard is how can it be you you find the power law, which is an equation, right? By an analysis of of the past, mm -hmm. you recognize that there's a there's a relationship between time and price, but you cannot explain why, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so that's where I'm stuck. I'm stuck. Does yeah. it matter? Does the why matter? Because yeah. if I think about the why part, for example, if more people understand this and more people buy it, less people yeah. sell it, you know. Then the price should go up. This should this should break, right? And it and and usually with tech, technology, it should go faster. But the power right. law actually doesn't go well. Uh, yes, in orders of magnitude as the time progresses, but it does not really go. It's not exponential. It doesn't go faster. Yeah. But okay. First, first of all, yeah. So, sometimes it makes sense to to make an empirical observation first. And understand what's going on uh, later on. So uh, a lot of things are like that in biology. There are a lot of power laws uh, which people didn't understand at at first. Um, so uh, there's a very simple relationship between the weight of an animal and its height, uh, things like that. Yeah. But there are many, many, many different power laws in in biology, and some of them don't didn't make sense to biologists at all at first, but still they were there and you could make predictions based on them. So just because you don't really understand what's going on doesn't necessarily mean that, that it's wrong. Um, that's the, the first thing. Um, but then I, I think for the power law, it's actually very simple. And what's going on is simply diminishing returns in terms of price. And those I think are really expected just from what I call a priori reasoning. So by reasoning on first principles that, you know, when Bitcoin got invented or when it was the very early days, the market cap of Bitcoin was extremely low. So you yeah. could show up with a bunch of money, say a million dollars and move the price by a lot. I mean, you could double the price or more in the very early days. Uh, if you just showed up with a million dollars and bought bitcoins for for a million dollars, that that was a major event. 
So it's very easy to move the price up. Now, if you want to double the price, you need way more than a million dollars. So this is where uh, the diminishing returns come in, that it gets harder and harder to pull the price up. That's basically it. Yeah, because the, the amount that you're buying from the total amount that's available in, in uh, let's say, in dollar terms, right, of the, as a percentage of the market cap, it, mo it just moves it less. Then again, I think uh, it's not critique. It's just for me to understand because it's funny, like how my mind goes. It's just like, but when there's, you know, price is determined on the margins, right? Uh, if I think 74% of Bitcoin didn't move in a year plus, so, you know, there's only a tiny percentage. And I hear, hear Giovanni say in my ear, scarcity is not uh, a thing <laughs> in Bitcoin. But I think that's a different way of first principles thinking like the less supply the more people who want it that's simple supply and demand right so there 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 has to be um a move in the price to accommodate a certain amount of people from from the demand and so yes, that definitely. that that should move it significantly more to the upside no but it does in linear terms yeah so uh, yeah whereas in the early days the price went up by uh, you know when you doubled it it went up by $100 or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, now, when you double it, it goes up by sixty-six thousand dollars. So that that's a big difference. Yeah. So that is how it's explained, basically. This what I said is uh, your your explanation is um, you you explain. Sorry, what you say now is an explanation as to what I just illustrated. Right, like that 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 is what happens. Yes, it does go up with a bigger magnitude over a bigger amount of time, basically. Yeah, it goes up. It does go up f faster and faster in linear terms. Yeah, uh, but there is an extra resistance to it, and that is that it it doesn't it doesn't take the same effort to move a million dollars as it does to move a billion dollars. So it gets more and more difficult. E even U.S. dollars are uh, limited in supply to some extent. <laughs> uh, yeah. Maybe you shouldn't see it that way because okay, there are a lot of dollars around, but it gets more and more difficult to to move them into Bitcoin. And mm. and that's where the sub exponential part comes in. Yeah. And so if there's going to be diminishing returns, will the, the drawdowns also be lower, you think? So um yeah, I I wrote an article saying that we will see diminishing returns in terms of, you know, for a year price increases or the, the long term trend will be sub exponential. Uh, but in addition, the volatility should be less. And yes, we, we are seeing some hints of that, even though it does seem that after every market peak, we do get something like an 80% drawdown. Not quite. So th those also tend to become smaller. Hmm. Uh, but there are other measures of volatility, and they do seem to be going down slowly. But there, there are hints that um, Bitcoin is becoming more stable over time. Yeah. Another and it's thing... my expectation that it will continue to be the case. And the, the, the reason for that is similar is that as Bitcoin grows in market cap, the order books become fatter. And so yeah. to, to move the price in either direction becomes more difficult just because there's more money lying around on the order books. So it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And so Giovanni also said, which I thought was an interesting point, like it should not go too fast. Because that would be unhealthy, um, yeah, like the well the, the, yeah. the the slow and steady, or let's yeah. call it slow and steady, actually ensures that you know it, it will become a fundamental part of the financial world or the entire world. Like, can you elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, I mean, if you if you think about exponential growth, and in some cases it can go on for a long time. For example, Moore's law is is a, is an example of an exponential law which has been going on for a long time. Moore's law is just how many transistors we can cram into a computer chip. So yeah. every 18 months or so, we can put twice as many transistors into a chip. And that doesn't strike us as something unstable. It just continues to, to hold true. And, well, I guess at some point it will slow down. Uh, it, it does, it's not something which we think, as, which we think of as dangerous. But there are other examples of, of exponential growth. For example, if you think of a closed ecosystem with bacterial growth and bacteria are doubling in number every 
few minutes or whatever. Um, very quickly, they reach a point in time where they use up all the resources in their closed environment. And when that's the case, they suddenly die. And, it's, mm. and it happens very quickly. So if you have a Petri dish and say the bacteria double in number every hour, um, one hour before they reach full capacity, there's, they're at half capacity. One hour before that, they're at 25% capacity. And one hour before that, there are so few bacteria, you bar barely see them. So it happens very quickly. You can have many, many hours when nothing happens and suddenly you, you, you reach catastrophe. Uh, so, so this is the danger of exponential growth. And you can see that in financial markets as well, uh, that you, you have, well, actually it's exponential growth for the stock market, but you have short periods where you have growth, which is really unsustainable. Mm. Yeah. Um, could be exponential or could be super exponential. And, and those just, yeah, when growth is too fast, it, it, it cannot hold on um, for too long. And ultimately, it results in a crash or just something that deflates. So sl slowly, then suddenly is not what we would want in Bitcoin then? Well, yeah, I guess for in the case of Bitcoin, it, it's hard to imagine how it could be exponential for a very long period of time because it would mean that Money is flowing in with no resistance. Exactly. Yeah. Basically, That's yeah. Point. And so we, uh, yeah, we should expect something like a power law. We should expect diminishing returns. And if we don't see that, I think it's it's a sign of a um, bubble inflating, which will deflate in the future. Yeah. And does the power law stop at any moment at at like a certain amount of adoption? Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, I wouldn't think of the power law in terms of adoption. I think that's that's really the the wrong way to think about it because even at a hundred percent adoption, we're going to continue to grow. But indeed, it, this is something that is not um, included in the power law right now. But well, the way it's expressed right now is that there will come a point in time where um, the growth in price is um, close to zero. In yeah, so it becomes stable in a sense. Yeah, it becomes stable. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I at least in nominal terms that will not happen because there will always be more and more of fiat currency uh, until fiat money disappears. But even then, uh, as we've spoken about productivity, productivity is expected to grow, and so I I expect um, the price of Bitcoin to continue to increase in the long term. But that will be a rate which is small compared to the current uh, growth rates. Yeah. So right now we're talking about growth rates of 50%, 40% per year. And I would expect the terminal growth rates to be something more like, I don't know, say 5% or, you know, ballpark 5% maybe, yeah. something like this. So there's still a lot of time ahead of us before we reach that point. Yeah. But and then there of are course actually it's 5% of a way higher price, right? Five percent of a way, way higher price. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, um, with the power law, you can kind of look towards the the future, right? Although, it, and it gives us a, a direction. Do you have any like highly likely scenarios and like unlikely scenarios? What What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So, um, at least the way I represent the power law is within a corridor. So there's a lower band and there's a, a higher band. Um, it's not very scientific, but I did that just to have a very fixed range of prices which are allowed and to be very clear about you know when, when I'm right and when I'm wrong. So as long as the price moves inside the band, I'm not proven wrong. I'm, I continue to be right. Uh, but I think the way to actually look at the power law is to look at the, the bottom of the price range. If you try to fit a, a line to the bottom of, of the price and you do that with the power law, you get something that is extremely stable. So already in 2013, actually, you would have been able to predict the current price, well, the, the, the price bottom we just had roughly a year ago. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's really stable and it's very predictive. So if I'm talking about scenarios that are, are likely, I would say that... Um, the bottom of this corridor is unlikely to be breached by much. 
uh, that that's the thing I have the most certainty about. The the top part, I I, I don't really know. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I, uh, th- this is the I think the graph that is th- that mostly stands out to me, and that also um, well, for people listening, they, they should check out the episode with uh, Giovanni because he has like he shows me the charts and he shares his screen. But that one I think is very interesting. Uh, yesterday I saw an animation of the power law, which uh, shows, and I think that also uh, illustrates the the steps that we are going to make, right? Also with the price, like that illustrates that, for example, one million is on the top line of the band in 2033, but it's almost at the bottom in 2034 uh, or ish around there. Maybe like within two years, it moves from more uh, from the top to the, to the, to the bottom trend. Yeah. um, Let me see. So um, just wanted to show you this animation first. Yeah. And this is what I meant with the bottom of the corridor, which is very stable. What we're simulating here is that we're going through time. Mm -hmm. Uh, And as we go through time, so here we're starting. As we're going through time, we're coloring the price in black. So anything that is black is known price, and gray is yet to be discovered price. So currently we're in 2015 or so, moving towards 2016. And we're trying to fit a power law through the price and see how well it predicts the future. And so there are two ways of really fitting a power law through the price. One is to try to fit, um, it's not correct mathematically, but say go through the middle of the price, um, mm-hmm. just try to do a least mean squares fit. And the other way is to try to fit the bottom of, of the curve. And uh, it turns out that fitting the bottom of the curve is much more stable in terms of forecasts. So yeah. that's really. Um, it's it's a highly predictive thing if you do that. Yeah, for the people not watching the video, like you see the two bands, but the top one moves most of the time, and the bottom one doesn't really move. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. And so the bottom of the curve is what I used in. Uh, let me see. To produce this plot. Yeah. Um, which was published in September 2019. And then it turned out that it, let me see, where did I put this? Oh, yeah, I think it was. Yeah, here. yeah, that, yeah. So it's the same plot again, but now the, the new price data is, is in red. Um, yeah. And, and then so, you are around like 70K, right? If I read yes, it yeah. correctly. Yeah. So it worked out quite well. I mean, the bottom has been tested twice. Uh, once in 2020, there was the COVID dip, and then again, um, was it end of 2022 or beginning of 2023? Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, here you see if you go to the million, I think that's what I was saying. Yeah, there you see it like right on the line in like 2034, between 2033, 2034. Then it's like in the middle, but then it quickly moves within. I'd say one cycle, four four ish years, then it's almost the bottom. Yes. Yeah. 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 That, that's very interesting. I think you now also have something that, that you can just keep using to show just uh, the progression of the power law, right? Yeah, exactly. So this is something I wanted to have. I wanted to have a track track record. Um so sort of skin in the game i made a forecast and if it turns out to be wrong well then i was wrong too bad uh, but yeah if if i'm right then i get to brag about it <laughs> yeah, yeah well, I, was... I still think it would be nice maybe maybe this is the moment to ask you but it would be nice to have like a table yeah right where you say like upper middle high and then per year or maybe like uh you know january june yeah uh, some, something yeah. like that right so yeah. um that that would be a nice image yep. to share, and maybe then like an extra column where it shows actual, actual price and, and maybe uh, deviation. But uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's super that. fascinating. It, it will well, be so. That I, I, yeah, I want to be a little bit careful that it, it shouldn't be taken as gospel either. So it's no, not no, no, because, no. Yeah, the price is in the middle that you should start selling <laughs> or something. 
Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so uh, as long as I write some some warning words about it, I think it's it's fine. Yeah. Uh, also, when I say I get to brag about this, I mean I get to brag about the graph. But it, it's really Giovanni who who uh, brought this power law to me. So um, he he gets the original bragging rights. But um, I'm still happy about the graph, though. Yeah. Are you helping him uh, with the uh, with the theory too? I think he's writing the paper that he wants to have like uh, peer reviewed. Uh, no, I, I'm I'm not. I, we we co-authored an article. Uh, we we worked extensively on that uh, together regarding some uh, econometric issues. But he's done a lot of stuff um, without me. He originally tried to convince me to to work with him, and I was just so time constrained that uh, we we de- yeah we didn't cooperate as much as maybe I would have liked. Yeah. I, well, actually, I don't know exactly what he's up to right now with this theory and what what exactly he's trying to publish. I think he's working on a paper that he eventually wants to have peer review to actually, um, yeah, pu- take this from what was a model into a real theory and then let other people, uh, well, of course, peer review it. But then, you know, that that would be. I'd say a, a pretty significant breakthrough if if that you know stays um, stays up upright, right? And 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 uh, while people scrutinize it, and I think it would kind of like open up this new um, dimension of Bitcoin. I'd say like the fact that you know something that is mathematically engineered eventually emulates a power law in real life. Mm-hmm. And it's digital and non-tangible and like all these things. It's that that's that's pretty wild. You know that that I I think it would elevate the story of Bitcoin also because we don't know who did this, right? Like, could they thought of this up front? I would say no, right? Because you don't know how. Well, uh, Satoshi removed himself from the forum and then was like, you know, good luck. So. You cannot really model that or predict that, right? Like, uh, I don't know, was your writing understandable enough for other people to like adopt it, or like even the tiniest things like that, right? So, the 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 fact that it shows the the power law with all these different dimensions that we talked about about just people understanding it and energy and adoption and addresses and all these things, like all these elements together. I don't know, like my short short thought or conclusion is that, that it, it really shows we need this in some way. Like people grasp it, they get it, and then it just kind of form follows this way of nature or something. I don't know, like maybe that's too woo-woo, but uh, I, f- I think it's fascinating that like it, it will open up that field, I think. And that maybe will get us to the why, like why does it work like this? Yeah, it is fascinating. I mean, if if... You had to think about it beforehand, like if Satoshi had been forced to think about how Bitcoin could evolve in, how the price of Bitcoin could evolve in time. Um, perhaps actually he could have thought of a power law uh, because the principle is really that you have diminishing returns over time. Mm. Uh, the specific function that uh, Giovanni used and that I use as well is the logarithm but you don't necessarily need to have a this logarithm um, you can you can have other powers as well so when you look at the derivative of the log price over time so normally you look at the log price over time and it, it goes upwards but with a downward bend so it goes up slower and slower but if you look at the derivative it's the opposite it's something that goes down which means mm. those are the diminishing returns. It's your what you expect in terms of percentage returns over years. Over the years, it goes down. And right now, this this um, shape is described as something. It's a parameter, free parameter times time to a power, and the power is just minus one. But it doesn't necessarily have to be minus one. It could be another value, say minus one point two or minus zero point eight, and that's still a power law. And so perhaps if you if someone had really thought about this beforehand, maybe that person could have dreamt up the power law. Mm. Maybe. Uh, but what is really surprising about this is that it has kept up over so many orders of magnitude. So yeah. that that's not necessarily the case. You might have said, okay, the, it 
roughly this is what happens, but you have so many interruptions, you have macroeconomic factors, you have news, you have technical problems. And so any of these things could have, you know, stopped the power law from happening just because of fear or something. Yeah. But, but it seems indeed that there is a natural rate of adoption for Bitcoin, which is given by this power law. Yeah. Yeah, that's and exactly that's my point. That's, that's wild. It, it, that's unexplainable, I'd say, right? Yeah. Because you could try to engineer anything, but the fact that it, yeah. despite all the attacks and all, you know, all, the, all these things against it, that it still exists, I think that that should be a threat that more people uh, could uh, could investigate because that is something special. Because most ideas, that's what I meant, like also with the adoption of Wall Street, right? Like most ideas die, most ideas suck, right? <laughs> and yeah, for some reason, this thing still keeps chugging along. And, Bitcoin yeah. almost died in during the first year, so Satoshi was the only one mining, and uh, he actually reduced his mining his hash rate over time and it was in October or so that it the hash rate reached the low point. And at that point it wasn't clear. I mean, was it just going to die with Satoshi who stopped mining or was it going to take off? But it took off. And um yeah. yeah. So indeed. Yeah. But yeah, I mean it, it, this this power law it's it's something that happens. It's not something that could have been designed by Satoshi. So even if you we went back in time and we asked the question, could Satoshi have designed Bitcoin in such a way that the price increase would have been 10 times higher um, than, than it is now? And I think the answer is no, he, he could not have done this. Yeah. Or could he have done something to not make it a power law, but make it an exponential? And then I think that then that is clearly not the case. He, that's not possible. Yeah, I agree. So, and, did, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and also we have to remember that even though it, it looks really remarkable that the price goes up seemingly very um, uh, consistently, it, it's not perfectly predictable. So it doesn't tell you exactly where the price is going to be. We looked at the ranges and, uh, you know, when, when is the price going to reach a million dollars? And there's a wide range of years. We don't know exactly when it's going to happen. Yeah, and I think that's the other trick of why this is possible. Because if it if it were known perfectly ahead of time, it it would be priced in. Yeah, well, exactly. Well, I th I think you know people. Um, I will I will link in the show notes to your article that you that you wrote with Giovanni, which is called "Bitcoin's Power Law Really Debunked." Um, but I I think this is one of the criticisms that people have. Maybe it comes from you know other models that exist that that people followed but like yeah well you you have this you say that there's this law and in the middle we see let's say 100k let's say 200k and and 50 percent below your lower band is 50 but your upper band is like 230 or 350 or something right and then people say like well yeah uh, i can make a model like that too with such a divergence mm -hmm. right but i i I don't, I don't know if we should get into that, but I think that's interesting. It's also, I think, from the experience of other people. But what I actually wanted to ask you, uh, because you also shared this with me, you also wrote an article, I think, to uh, Taleb, Nassim Taleb, mm -hmm. or was it, yeah, Taleb, right? Like, why are these well-known people and respected to some degree, right? Like Peter Schiff, Nassim Taleb, who who claims Bitcoin is worth and is going to zero, and Nouriel, Nouriel Rubini and Paul Krugman, who's a Nobel Prize winning economist why are they so adamantly wrong about this like they should have the informed critiques but all I hear is emotional blubber like what, what do you think yeah yeah it's a, it's a mystery I mean uh, yeah how, how can you be how can you be that dumb or that stubborn <laughs> I don't know right like uh, yeah no but seriously I mean um, it doesn't sound yeah. nice but I mean it's the only <laughs> I, I don't know either yeah yeah, it, it, it's really strange. I mean, at least for Taleb, you could say, okay, he still gets the benefit of the doubt because he wrote his black paper uh, not that long ago. But Rubini has been saying that Bitcoin is headed to zero ever since 2014. And so uh, in what world must he live in where he gets proven wrong all the time and he still thinks that he's going to be proven right? 
uh, it must be very bizarre and you must have a very strong ability to delude yourself. Mm. It, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. I mean, he's just completely off the rails. Um, insane. <laughs> yeah, the, it's, yeah, it's yeah, it's really w weird and and stranger still. I mean, he gets invited to shows and he he gets presented as being a great economist. Uh, how how can that be? What does it say about the quality of the people who invite him? <laughs> I mean, this is really 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 fair strange. point. <laughs> yeah. And not only does he do that about Bitcoin, he does this about the stock market as well. So. Some people praise him because he predicted the great financial crisis in a way. Uh, he didn't really predict it. He was just a broken clock. I mean, he kept saying the same thing forever and forever. He just kept saying, don't invest in the stock market. It's too risky right now. And then, of course, at some point, the stock market crashed. And he said, ha, there you go. I was right. Yeah. <laughs> he has been, I think he's been saying the stock market is going to crash every year since the great financial crisis as well. So it's 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 really ridiculous. I guess he just creates his brand around this that he says that things are risky, and um, yeah, that's it. Of course, Bitcoin yeah. is risky. We know that. It's uh, yeah. It's a new it's a new thing. Every, it's a new yeah. thing. Yeah. Well, everything is risky. Then I would say, right? Like uh, investing in Tesla is also risky because you want yeah. Elon to wake up in the morning, right? Like that. But I think this is funny. Like this is the words that they use, right? There's no. I, I I tried to watch tried to watch the zero hedge debate with um with uh um Rubini and uh, and Schiff. Ah, I didn't even know about this. Thing. You don't have to watch it. Like it's fifteen minutes of emotional disturbance almost, I wanna say. Like, yeah, it's going to zero, it's nothing, it's isn't it, but there's no substance, right? And I think that is yeah. Also one of the things that, that, that Bitcoiners really see is like, how can you sit there and talk without any, like, like have this opinion, like back it up, like explain it. Right. But it's all just screaming and um, yeah, I don't know. Just fascinating. I, I just want to get your take on it, but it's just, it's unbelievable actually, as in, is this real? <laughs> you know, are these people real? Yeah. 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 Taleb to me is, yeah. In, in a way it's, it's the same thing. Um, T Taleb is someone I respected a, lo a lot for his books, and I, I think he, he did a great work uh, with them. He's also obviously very uh, fluent in mathematics, and what he does mathematically is is, is correct. Uh, but maybe this isn't clear to everyone, but I, I read his Bitcoin black paper because I, I was interested in what he had to say. Um, he's a person I respected, so I wanted to see if there was something interesting in his arguments against Bitcoin, basically, or why he thinks that Bitcoin should and will head towards zero. Yeah. And it was immediately clear to me that he created a mathematical veil which can paint a picture like that, that Bitcoin must be headed to zero because math. But if you peek just behind the veil, there's nothing left. It's, it's also, it, it felt like a very emotional appeal to me and not something mathematical even though he uses math of course in his paper mm. but if, if you just scratch a little bit it, it just all collapses it doesn't make any sense whatsoever yeah 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 interesting yeah it's just interesting it's just uh, i would love to see the and uh, yeah more enthusiasm in these people in some sense you know but uh well anyway maybe he, that is our task now you know? if he says i don't want to to invest in bitcoin of course it's yeah. his choice and he should uh it's, it's his right he, he, yeah. he shouldn't be forced to, to do it but i i think it's it's not a good idea to uh be so fundamental and say that no one should do it it will definitely reach zero because it's mathematically assured to do so that's that's just uh lying to people and it's 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 not fair because it it removes them potentially removes them from a from a great opportunity yeah. it's a bigger risk to warn um against bitcoin than to to be in favor of it i to agree it's people to buy at least a little bit yeah depending on situation etc you have to do it responsibly of course and uh, take risks according to your own finances yeah I'm looking at the time, but I still have two questions. So let's see how short this answer can be. But I'm, I'm, I, I doubt it. But I wanted to paraphrase uh, Jeff Booth. You know, he says, when we measure or price everything we produce in Bitcoin, everything will become more affordable and 
you know, we move into this era of abundance that, that he talks about. So we need Bitcoin as a store of value, a medium of exchange, which I think we're heading to, right? It, 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 it can only be a medium of exchange is it, if it is a store of value before of that. But, but equally important is unit of account. And, and you've talked about this before. How do we get to this unit of account point and, and what are the challenges? Uh, yeah, uh, that's a great question. So I don't have a clear picture of how how Bitcoin is really going to be the global medium of exchange. Um, to me, it's very clear that the store of value part is going to be the dominant part for many years to come. Uh, we have very far to go in, in that respect. Um, just when I think about retirement funds, uh, sovereign wealth funds, I think it's virtually assured that sooner or later central banks will buy Bitcoin because it's uh, it's almost the perfect um, foreign asset that that um, that a central bank can buy to potentially strengthen its own currency. Yeah. So we have very far to go in that respect, but I think volatility will remain, and that will make it difficult to get Bitcoin to be the dominant medium of exchange and and there are some other uh arguments that make it even a little bit more difficult and and here actually i have to say that taleb is right in his black paper uh, because he wrote uh, i remember two arguments uh but those are valid in my opinion he he says that government employees are paid in us dollars in the us in euro in europe they're paid in euros etc but they're paid in fiat. Mm. And government spending is a huge part of GDP. So already a big chunk of GDP is virtually assured to be in fiat currency. And that might make it a bit more difficult for Bitcoin to be adopted. Not necessarily. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't stop it. So of course, we could have very pro-Bitcoin politicians in the future. And I expect the upcoming generations to be more pro-Bitcoin than the current one. Uh, but still, it might make it more difficult. Also, um, we, we don't live in a world with perfect globalization. So there are some things which you cannot really arbitrage over distance, like you know haircuts and uh, car repairs. And I think those are the exact examples that Taleb took in his own black paper. And that makes it, it gives a reason for multiple currencies to exist around the globe basically, because you have things that are difficult to arbitrage over a distance. Yeah. So to have just one one money, basically, that no one uses dollars anymore, no one uses euros, everyone just uses bitcoins, I think that will take, I don't know. It, it, I guess it will happen, uh, but it, 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 will take, it will take quite a bit of time. Yeah. Probably well, decades. I, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would agree. I, I, I think... The, the, of course, there can still be other currencies or monies next to Bitcoin, right? But I think if Bitcoin should be the thing that we measure everything against, and then whatever we use to, um, you know, let's say physically exchange value or determine value or um, at a hairdresser in Nigeria or Amsterdam or Australia, right? Like that's, of course, up to the people that are, that are active there. Yeah. But and yeah, right, yeah. Right now, we we even have uh, altcoins or uh, shit coins. I don't know how you call them on on your show, um, but those are also units of account which are not Bitcoin, and so in a way, they they threaten the mm -hmm. Bitcoin standard. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think this is uh, this is a bit too far out, perhaps, but uh, I, I wanted to ask it anyway. Um, yeah, let's let's move on to the last question. I I ask everyone the same the same question, and that is, what is a core belief that you will never let go? Oh, oh boy! <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh boy, yeah, because uh, core belief. Yeah. Uh... Uh, it's tough. Uh, I will not say something monetary about Bitcoin or something like that. Uh, you should try to do should try to do good not only for yourself but for uh, 
for humanity and life in general. Uh, so I think you can you can detect if an idea is good or bad by thinking if if it is harmful or if it does good to humanity and life in the long term. And so if you judge things this way, then you can immediately say that communism is a terrible idea. Um, the current trend of you know wokeism and uh, everything that is opposed to human procreation and expansion of the human species into other realms whether it be living on the ocean or in space uh things like that then um it's a bad idea love that man thanks thanks for sharing and thanks so much for coming on and uh yeah as i mentioned i will link to your profiles and your articles so people can check that out and uh follow you along uh the price uh, evolution journey of uh, of bitcoin man so um yeah Thank you. Thank you very much, Bram. It was uh, very nice talking to you. Cheers. Have a great day. You too. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review, and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bram K. That's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening.